Good afternoon, and welcome to Navigating CMIO Enterprise Challenges Through the Technology Maelstrom, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by GE Healthcare and Roche. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We have some interactive features, namely our questions and comments box. We encourage you to send your questions in and comments as they occur to you, and we will uh, take most of those later in the program, but go ahead and send them in as they occur to you, and you can download the deck by using the URL on your screen, and it's at the bottom of most of our slides, and it's been sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to have our main discussion with uh, Dr. Stacy Johnston, Chief Medical Information Officer with Baptist Health, and then we're going to have our audience Q&A. So without further delay, we're going to get started with our conversation with Dr. Johnston. So Dr. Johnston, please give us some highlights of Baptist Healthcare um, to sort of set the context for today's talk. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to represent Baptist Health. We are um, an organization based on Christian values uh, established in 1955 with one smaller hospital located in downtown Jacksonville. And now we have uh, five hospitals, soon to be six, uh, 51 uh, clinics, including specialty clinics, and a uh, state-of-the-art children's hospital that is nationally ranked. We serve Northeast Georgia, uh, Northeast Florida, as well as Southeast Florida. Um, Georgia, and we have um, uh, have been expanding. We do have uh, four uh, standalone satellite EDs uh, that um, we are taking care of the patients across this region and are hoping to continue to expand and grow. All right, very good. All right, you are an active MD. So um, first, tell me tell me sort of what that means. Um, and then let's go into your career and background a little bit. Um, obviously, the, I guess the IT came later, uh, but talk about developing an interest in that and how you sort of came into this part of the industry. Sure. So, so when I was in residency, it just happened to be at the opportune time when both the inpatient setting and our clinic uh, was migrating from paper charts to electronic health records. And at that point in time, they a lot of that was actually run by residents, and they needed super users. So I became a super user, and by the time I graduated, I was fairly pro proficient in a CPOE, and electronic order entry was very new at that time, um, and, as well as documentation templates. Um, so then when I became an attending as a hospitalist, I went to a smaller community hospital in Beaufort, South Carolina called Beaufort Memorial Hospital. And at that time they were also on paper, so I got to migrate not only once but now twice um, mm. from paper to electronic health records. And because I was the only physician in that system that had any experience with um, electronic order entry and documentation templates, um, I became the guinea pig. And so uh, you know, very much a, a super user. I was willing to try new things. Um, and so ultimately, I ended up being at Beaufort for nine years. Um, but as the super user kind of morphed into what I like to call as the last man standing, I became the CMIO. And somehow, um, I think it was just the fact that I kept going to more and more meetings and attending more and honestly, it was completely selfish. I'll just let you know I'm a completely selfish person. I really wanted the system to work well for me, so I thought, well, I'm going to go to the meetings and make sure it you know, that we focus on continual improvement of our electronic health record. Um, and so while there, we went from um, an implementation of Meditech to the newer version of Meditech. So I got to go through two implementations. Um, and I continue to see uh, patients there. Again, I'm a hospitalist. That's my background. So um, while at Beaufort, I had an amazing time. I really was able to cut my teeth. Um, and part of the reason that I ended up at Baptist was my children, my, I have twin daughters, uh, they were graduating from eighth grade and were you know, getting ready to start high school. And we thought, well, this 
this break, this natural break in school, um, was a good time to start looking. And it, it just happened to be that Baptist was looking for the CMIO. Um, and my children uh, had never lived in a city. They loved being in a small town, but just the thought of living in a city really appealed to them in their high school career. So we ended up up, up on faith. Um, it was picked up and moved to Jacksonville, Florida here, in, and uh, I started at Baptist um, as the associate CMIO with a planned transition to become the CMIO after our current, the current CMIO at that time was transitioning out of that role and would move uh, more into the analytics space. So he's still working here, um, and then I became the CMIO here at Baptist in October. Um, and then, oddly enough, um, we actually just announced that we will be um, implementing EPIC. So I get to implement again. So I am super excited about this opportunity um, and, and taking our organization into you know, an integrated platform. At this time, we are um, on Cerner in the acute space and TouchWorks in the ambulatory space. Um, so really just have a struggle with integration, and so the decision was to move to a, a more integrated platform. All right, very good. So <clears throat> you mentioned there that uh, you had the feeling uh, when you started to have to use the electronic medical record, I want this to work for me, so I'm going to get in and get involved with making this better. Um, do you think that's good messaging for CMIOs in general to use to the clinicians towards the clinicians who are going to use the system, hey, you got to use this anyway. So right. why not help us improve it? Because that worked for you. Yeah, I mean, that's what, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, especially with this EPIC implementation for us, my goal is to have as many end users involved. And, and that's my message is the more involved you are, the better it will be for you. And, and as, you know, we've joined with the Arch Collaborative, um, so it's not just about what system it is, it's also about how the mastery of their system. So how well the workflows are designed to them, how well they, um, how much time they spend in personalization, and then of course the focus on training. So there's three elements that will help your end users become masters in the EMR. And that, that first component is really focusing on your workflows. That's where the end users can come in and help design the system to meet their needs. And, and I, I really think that's an important message to send to them. Very good. All right, let's talk a little bit about the challenges and benefits of balancing the two perspectives, the IT side and the clinical side, both to you and the enterprise. Of course, that's part of the job. Right, that's the job sure. perhaps, is yeah. that balance between the two sides to create some sort of harmonious interplay. So your thoughts there? Yeah, so really that is my main job description, is to represent physicians to the enterprise, but then to also come back um, with new technologies and new ideas to the, the operational and clinical folks. And so mm -hmm. the way I think of the CMIO is, is a triad relationship. So you have clinical and operational on one side, and then you have technical on, on the other side. And truly the CMIO is the one that bridges that gap. And so it's a, it's a very special relationship that you know I've really tried to embrace and I encourage all to embrace is, is not just focusing on the technical and not just focusing on the clinical or operational, but really bridging that gap, getting the end users together with your analyst and, and having that symbiotic relationship um, uh, you know, to help us get to where we need to be. Um, I think of the CMIO as a, as a change agent. You know, we are there, we're, we're there at the grassroots, we're, we're there you know, working with our physicians and, and other clinicians, pharmacy, nurses, um, to make sure that the technology is meeting their needs, but also as new technology comes on, we're working with them to evaluate their workflows and their processes and procedures. Right. So it's a bit of a you know an honest broker to represent each side to the other side. Um, you know, the idea is that why do we need CMIOs? Because IT doesn't really understand or perhaps care too much about clinical workflow. Um, and the clinicians just don't want change, you know, sure. and, I, and I've heard from, from, you know, we've had other doctors on the line here, like yourself, who said, you know, I've got enough going on. 
in order to make good clinical decisions. I've got so much going on. I can't have technology disrupting me and interrupting me. Right. And one thing I always say is I want to do I want to do technology advancements with providers, with physicians, and not to them. And so as, as part of that change management, part of it is the understanding of why it's important to change. So what are we looking to gain out of this new um, technology or new power plan, whatever we're trying to implement? And so we have to explain not only the why, but we have to understand the value it's going to add to the providers that are going to be responsible for ultimately adopting and utilizing the, the technology that we implement. Talk a little bit about the genesis of uh, an initiative or an idea and how that might affect your role of managing it or investigating it. So you could have, although it's, you know, it's not a best practice per se, you can have IT, they can have ideas. Maybe they come across something interesting and they have an idea and want to run it by the clinical folks that, hey, would this help you? Or you could have clinical folks that say, I'm having trouble here, or I heard about this tool. Sometimes even the vendors go straight to the clinicians to create that groundswell of interest, which CMIOs and CIOs don't really love that. It's sort of the end around. Um, so what about the genesis of the idea versus how the idea is managed? Yeah, so I, I think that's a really great point. Um, we are, we at Baptist are really trying to be cognizant of um, advancements in technology um, as uh, operationally and clinically led. And so, for instance, there, um, I recently went to an AI conference and we brought in a consulting firm that evaluated how we could potentially advance some AI um, here at Baptist. And obviously AI is kind of this buzzword and really what does that mean? And, and I, I think it's not quite as advanced as we'd all like it to be. However, there are some ideas of how we can maybe capture some low hanging fruit with robotic process automation, um, some more um, cognitive uh, algorithms, and so one that was brought up um, from the evaluation was possibly bringing in um, uh, this cognitive machine algorithm that would help us um, give some clinical decision support to our end users. So the, the question is, how are we going to find value in that and what are the use cases? Um, so I reviewed the potential algorithms that were available. And um, one that I found fascinating was palliative care and possibly being able to identify which patients would be more appropriate for a palliative care discussion in the hopes that this would um, prevent readmissions and help better identify, you know, more focused quality of life um, towards the end of life. And at the same time, we have a, a work group of clinicians, including um, physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacy, as well as nurses, that is being managed under the population health aspect, um, called the Clinical Transformation Work Group. So I have the AI committee asking, let's bring in more AI, but I actually needed the clinicians to drive this. So mm -hmm. I brought this to the clinicians in charge of the Clinical Transformation Work Group based on palliative care and I thought there's this you know potential cognitive machine algorithm that could facilitate your work that you're currently pursuing under the palliative care clinical transformation work group so this would be one piece of the puzzle not the entire work um, that they're that they're pursuing so once I engaged with them and they they found value and, and thought that this would be the perfect first use case of us trying to advance our AI, AI here at Baptist. So now I have the clinicians asking for it. And so they're super excited. And we've actually just had it already approved. And now we're working through contracting um, with that. And, and so although it's cool technology coming, but at the end of the day, we aren't going to advance it as far as we need to until I have the physician saying, yeah, we, we really want this to be part of our work stream. Right. So it's it's okay for IT to bring things up and introduce ideas, but it's not okay to sort of pursue them to an implementation without the support of clinicians. Because okay. you don't want IT just sitting back. That's not the right. goal is just saying, hey, I don't know, whatever you guys want to do, because they're there 
to come up with ideas and let clinical people know and clinical leaders know about new things that are available. Right. Exactly. It, it's really and a facilitation is the perfect word. So I, I, you know, help facilitate that conversation between these new ideas that are being generated by, you know, our technology teams or, you know, the technology groups that go to these conferences. And then I bring these ideas to the, the end users, the physicians, and say, hey, I saw this. Is this something you'd be interested in? And if so, let me get, you know, let me get a WebEx scheduled. Let's bring this, um, this vendor in for, you, for a demonstration for you. Um, and if you find that potential value in it, then let's consider pursuing this further. So really, again, that facilitation between technology and end users. Right. Very good. All right, next question. How do you see your role in relation to clinician satisfaction or even retention? And I think, uh, you know, the, the burnout issue uh, comes up there, um, especially in regards to advancing technology. So how much of that is on you or on your mind in your role, clinician retention? Obviously satisfaction, but also retention. Sure. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I actually sit on the um, – I'm a charter member of the Physician Burnout Committee. As we know, um, physician satisfaction, physician burnout isn't just the EMR, um, but as studies sh have shown, it's anywhere from 50 to 70 percent attribute at least one portion of their burnout or stressors related to technology. And um, so based on that, the, the technology can help facilitate their work but if it's not implemented well or if it's not trained well, then it can actually add a burden to their to their day. So we're looking at um, physician satisfaction in multitude of ways. We're looking at a kind of team-based um, care. We're looking at uh, trying to identify burnout earlier using some of the different um, matrix scores, um, actually addressing burnout at the time of orientation, um, taking away the stigma of burnout, um, and then, of course, that whole um, addressing the technology and how technology can either contribute or, or alleviate burnout. And, and part of that was um, my decision to join with the Arch Collaborative and really focusing on the the tools that will help us enable our users. And so one thing we've recently done is I've identified that our, our physician training strategy has um, a little room for improvement. I mean, we all have opportunities. And so, you know, I, I like to look at that as something cool we get to do. So, um, so we're bringing in a consulting firm and really evaluating our physician training program. Um, for instance, on the inpatient side, your first day on, you, st you spend four to six hours in a classroom um, learning click here, click here. Well, I mean, by the end of six hours, you're not retaining anything. And so my, uh, my suggestion was that we uh, – our approach should be more uh, computer-based training modules at home on, patient, on, on the provider's own time and that they come in for more of a personalization session, again, aligning with Arch Collaborative, mastery of your EHR, um, how well you're trained, and personalization. So, so that one-hour session, one- to two-hour session, depending on how much time you need, should be really focused on workflows and should be focused on personalization. And the other thing that we're, we're focusing on doing right now is that like-to-like -like training. So a surgeon training a surgeon, um, mm -hmm. a, a hospitalist training a hospitalist, um, ambulatory training ambulatory. So really focusing on that end user experience, I'm hoping can help with that um, physician satisfaction and, and decreasing physician burnout. The other thing is I do recommend if organizations haven't done this yet is do the Arch Collaborative measurement, the initial measurement. Um, it allows for you to see where you are as an organization. And if you're doing amazing, then that's awesome. We definitely had a lot of room for improvement in, in terms of end user experience. Um, and so we will remeasure, you know, probably not every year, but maybe every other year to make sure we are continuing to move the mark in terms of that end user experience. When you were um, practicing full time, uh, did you ever? come close to burnout? Do you understand, you know, what that feels like? And I don't know, just more of a, a personal um, interest, I mean, yeah. or, or discussion about it. Did you see it? Do you get it? I, trust me, I got yeah. it. So when I was, yeah. Especially with I, twins, right? Yeah, Especially twins, with twins. And then I had another one. So what was I thinking, right? Um, 
So, oh boy. Um, you know, I, I think part of the problem with burnout is it's so hard to recognize until you, you're so far in. Um, but what I was experiencing was kind of lack of empathy towards my patients. And so that was very hard because I'm naturally a very empathetic person and uh, very compassionate. And then so I would go in and, you know, I, I would struggle trying to have these conversations with patients and their families, and they keep wanting me to come back and talk to them, which I get it as a family member, you know, who have who have dealt with sick family members, you know, I want the answers. I want to talk to the doctor. And so when I was starting to feel that way, I knew it was time to reevaluate, you know, what am I, what do I need to do in my life? And so, and sometimes, unfortunately, it's not just cutting back in, in your hours. Um, you know, initially, we always thought that the key to burnout was taking, oh, go take a vacation, you'll feel, you'll feel better, and then you'll come back. And actually, that's not really the case. It's, it's really spending that time on um, autonomy, um, being able to choose your schedule. So that's one thing um, that we had really focused on was um, – being more flexible in our scheduling and also looking at the number of encounters we were having on a daily basis um, and know when to call in for help. And, and that's where I had originally struggled with was having delegation. Um, you know, I'm definitely a control freak. I, I don't know if anyone knows me out there in the, the world, um, but I like to make sure, I, I like to make sure everything's managed, but and more in such a way that I just want to make sure it's done really well. And so, um, so I was having trouble delegating. So I was seeing, you know, 20 patients a day and trying to be a CMIO and a medical director. And and so I, I was definitely um, feeling, again, that, that first symptom for me was really lack of empathy. Then once we started making some adjustments to scheduling um, and that I was able to help um, identify the need for delegation more um, that helped me um, be able to address my, my burnout needs. Did the technology you had to use at that point have any role in, in your frustrations at the time? Yeah, you know, technology is, is a never-ending process. And so part of it is um, the, we add a lot, you know, and so we add all these clicks for regulatory requirements or meaningful use and you click here, click here, or this is a required field. But the more we add, it, mm -hmm. it seems like we never really take away. And right. so th the question is, you know, if we add more, is there something we can do better? Or is there some other workflow we can um, identify? Is there something we can take away? For instance, I mean, it's just a little small thing. Um, we're changing our registration order to have the diagnosis mandatory um, currently at, at Baptist um, in, in order to capture our CDI appropriately and, um, you know, for back-end billing. Um, so that's going to be a mandatory field on every single registration order. Um, but on the flip side, there's a, a mandatory field that's not being used. So I said, well, if that field isn't being used, why don't we turn that one off so that when we turn on the diagnosis, it's kind of a wash. And then, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be less, uh, you know, the same amount of work overall, but we're capturing the right information, not the wrong information. Really good point. I think that's something for people to think about. If you're adding, try and take away. So at least you kind of stay neutral. Um, very good point. Um, let's. Uh, how do you? How does your role interact with other C level roles, and where do you experience the greatest challenges to your desired clinical initiatives? So you got a number of C level roles, right? Obviously, you've got your CEO, COO, you've got your CIO, who is probably a very close relationship there, and then also interestingly, you've got a CISO now, right? Well, right. Not now, but they've been around for a while. But that's yeah. becoming more and more critical, ever more critical, right? right? The security aspect of anything that's done. Then you got your CTO who may be focused on more of the nitty gritty technology and things like that. Um, so just how do you navigate? There's a lot of people. Now sometimes you've got chief application officers or you've got chief data officers. You may have chief innovation officers. So all of a sudden that's pretty pretty full room. Um, I, the, if I could say one word, I'd say texting. So texting is my best friend. So, um, but you know, I, um, I've been very fortunate to org, um, work in, in my last two organizations where the C levels were very approachable. Um, 
and to the point where we truly did have each other's cell phone numbers. And so sometimes it's something as easy as, you know, I, I just, we're having some planned downtime. I would like to send out a core text to the entire medical staff that does have to get approved at the CMO level. I'll just send them a message and say, hey, this is my, um, my thoughts. What are you thinking? And, you know, um, he would, you know, typically approve it. Um, and also having that integrated relationship where we meet frequently. Um, so there are, uh, at uh, Baptist, our senior lead leaders, we meet quarterly to discuss um, any burning topics. We also then get a report out from the CEO. So it, it's not just unidirectional. You know, it's not just a report out, but we also get to report out where we are, um, any changes, for instance, in technology. Um, and then in terms of the CIO and Chief Technology Officer relationship, I, I do biweekly meetings with the CIO. I do monthly meetings with the CTO. I was doing weekly meetings with the CNIO. And, um, I forgot that. Forget the yeah, CNIO. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, I do uh, biweekly meetings with our Chief uh, Physician Executive and um, I have the CMO, the CMO on speed dial when we were um, having a planned downtime of approximately 17 hours um, when we were moving to remote hosting. It was uh, a lot of it was technology, obviously, with moving to remote hosting. We felt very comfortable in our technology and that we were going to be prepared for technology, but that operational and how do you manage, you know, these sickest of sick patients and and strokes and emergency surgery and neurocritical care patients all during a downtime. Mm -hmm. um, so that was actually more clinically and operationally driven. And I honestly, it was a longstanding joke with him that I would call my husband first to let him know I was on the way home. I would call my mom to make sure she's good. And then I would call the CMO to, you know, we'd talk our day through. So um, I, I think it's really about communication and mm -hmm. just making sure that you're um, open with your communication and that you're also available for communication and just responding timely um, to emails, responding timely to calls, um, and just making sure that, that people know that you are, you know, that you want to be included in their, in their communication and that you are willing to communicate back with them. And let's talk a little bit about texting. I find, I find that interesting. Um, so is it just that email is overloaded? There's a lot of non-essential things coming in, a lot of unsolicited things coming in email. And so it's a much larger volume uh, and sort of a lower quality and that texting, we don't quite have that problem. So it, it, is that what it is? Is that why yeah, it works? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we definitely have a significant amount of email coming in. And mm -hmm. then you, I'm sure everyone here on this call is familiar with that email string that people reply all to some and then reply to two people on the other email <laughs> and then reply just back to you on one. The next thing you know, there's 10 emails within this body. Kind of my rule is if there's three email, emails going back and forth, I pick up a phone. And so it's just yeah. sometimes easier just to um, take less time, have that quick phone call. Um, and so I actually, a lot of my communication may be initially with an email, um, and then depending on how quickly I need this communication to be, it would be a phone call or, or a quick text message. Um, right. one, one way that I do utilize the email that I, I think is, um, neat and it's kind of fun is I actually email, um, um, uh, the the physicians and um, sometimes it's just something as hey there's new functionality coming and it's being turned on next week all the way to hey by the way we're going to Epic um, and so you know um, so <laughs> you email out the physicians and at the end of each email just a little tidbit I always add a fun trivia fact so um, and I put a little cat I put the picture to it sometimes it's trivia of the like this day in history I'll add attach that trivia uh, a lot of times it's Star Wars. I'm a big Star Wars fan, so I always nice. make sure I include Star Wars trivia, you know, periodically as well, too. Very cool. Uh, you, you did mention um, a lot of meetings. Um, so just real quick, uh, I guess any executive can get overloaded with meetings where you look at your calendar and you say, I don't have any time to actually do any of the work that may come out of these meetings. I just got meetings and then I got to right. go home. So exactly. how does that work? How, how do you that manage work? that? So I'm still working through that. Um, <laughs> for, yeah, I, I definitely think that is, you know, for me, a work in progress. Um, I think having a really great administrative assistant, mm -hmm. if possible, is helpful. 
Um, the other thing is, um, thanks, you know, this is a call out to my friends in Arch Collaborative. Um, they recommended to me to read the book Essentialism. Essentialism is awesome, and it's really focusing just kind of like on the here and now. And so, you know, when you're evaluating whether you need to be in a meeting, say, is it truly essential that I'm there, or is this something that I could delegate to someone? And so, you know, it's about delegation, making sure that the meetings you attend add value to your life that truly are essential for you to continue working. Also, taking time for yourself, you know, making sure you're getting enough sleep, um, you know, having fun in the office. It's, it's really about creating a fun atmosphere um, and, you know, bringing joy to work, um, but, but also really focusing on today. Like, it, it's here and now. So when I'm in a meeting, that's truly all I'm focusing on. I am, I am so focused on that one person, I don't even actually know what my next meeting is. So not until that meeting's over do I, I really kind of know about, okay, what next? And so... Um, I mean, you have to take that with a grain of salt. I mean, obviously, um, you know, I ha you know, I know big things coming up in the next couple of days. But for your kind of your day to day, just really focus on today, and and you know, don't worry so much about what happened in the past because you you can't change that. You can obviously take um, lessons learned away from what happened in the past, but take those lessons learned and m move forward. And um, and also don't fret about what's going to happen in the future because that is something you also really can't control. So really kind of focus on the here and now. And that's the one thing I definitely recommend for any of you who haven't read it. It's a great book. It's called Essentialism. Uh, it's on Audible. For I have a 45-minute car I love ride. Audible. I love I Audible. I get to listen to all my books on, yeah. in the car ride. Well, I wrote, I wrote it down, and that's a great point. And, yes, uh, we've all seen – people in meetings who are obviously not listening and on their phone. So not only is there no point in them being there, but they're irritating whoever's holding the meeting and right. the people who are paying attention and they're dealing with something else. So if you want to go deal with that thing, why don't you go somewhere else? Right. Right. So. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Very good. Next question. How do you position uh, new groundbreaking technology initiatives up to leadership and out to the clinical and operational teams and which is more challenging? So, you know, and I think this is kind of what we were talking about where um, there might be new ideas. So another one, and I'll just call out, you know, I love stealing ideas. There's a, another CIO that I met um, at, a, at a conference, and he said, I haven't met a friend I couldn't use. And so <laughs> I just think it's great, you know. Um, so really just um, and, and taking ideas that have worked for other organizations mm -hmm. um, and can that work here. For instance, um, I went to HIMSS last year, and Oshner presented a great topic on um, device um, patient wearables and integration and using that data and capturing that data and helping it make clinical decisions. So we actually are in the process of developing what we call healthy living centers. And um, so what I did was kind of sat on this. Again, I was kind of new to Baptist, and I didn't want to come right in and say, hey, I have all these awesome ideas. So I had to bide my time. Um, and then I, I approached it to the CIO and said, hey, you know, I'd like to consider pursuing this app bar, you know, where we can talk about, um, you know, uh, showing Baptist apps as well as selling devices um, that, you know, are Bluetooth enabled that we can eventually start capturing this data. Um, and he thought, yeah, you know, that sounds kind of cool. Well, let's um, bring it up to the consumer engagement team. So I brought it up to the consumer consumer engagement team and said, hey, I have this idea about this app bar. And I said, admittedly, I stole the idea, but it worked really well there. Is that something we can pursue here? Um, and so we are actually in the process of developing these app bars, and they're, they're called Healthy Living Centers. We're actually taking it one step further where we are embedding it in the YMCAs. And so you will not only be able to download all of the Baptist apps as well as the apps that are recommended by our EHR vendors, um, but you will be able to um, purchase um, appropriate wearables, appropriate scales, and um, then you'll have time to meet with a health coach um, and nutritionist as well, too, all, all while, um, you know, getting ready to go work out while you're at the Y. I think it's a really cool concept. And, and so that is something that started hearing 
from a technology standpoint where you know you go to this conference and you hear about something really cool you just kind of trickle the idea a little bit up you know obviously you know um, I would bring it up to whoever you report to first before you start going off rogue um, but then you know making sure you're approaching the right people and in this case it was our consumer team very good. I just want to remind our audience to go ahead. If you have a question, just send it in in the Q&A box, and we will take a look at it. Um, next question. How might you use the CMIO position as a megaphone for any key topics you try to champion? So, you know, the CMIO role is definitely something that is very special, and um, you're you're a leader in in to that two realms that we were talking about, not only technology, but um, and clinically. And so a lot of times the CMIO may call out processes and it's not actually technology. Um, for instance, we are um, struggling with getting our e-prescribing numbers up um, and that's the technologies in place. We have the e-prescribing e of controlled substances available. We have you know, patient preferred pharmacy all built into the system, but there's a process problem. And so, um, and so once we've identified that there are some potential areas of improvement, bringing the right people to the table, so bringing your process improvement team, bringing your other clinical leaders to the team, um, you know, it should not be standing alone, you know, that you should stand together and as a united team um, to get the change that you're looking for um, and, and really trying to focus on um, patients. That, that's the one thing I always say is no matter what technology we're trying to improve or implement or what process we're trying to change, let's always think about the reason why we're here. We're here for patient care. And is this something that, if not done properly, could negatively affect patient care? And when you phrase it like that, a lot of times people are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let's, let's really try to focus on doing that. Let's, let's work together to, to improve um, whatever process we're, we're trying to address. Um, so I do meet frequently with the OPI team. Um, we we have um, also um, meetings where I go to meet with a hospitalist, and so we have like a, a hospice IT steering committee where we look at our current processes. Are there any anything, um, whether it's a power plan that can be improved, or is there something that sometimes when you order it doesn't work quite right, and therefore it's probably you know potentially affecting patient care. I also sit on the quality improvement committees. Um, and, and so I think the more you can be engaged, the more visible you are, the more people are going to come to you and say, hey, this didn't work quite right. Mm -hmm. And some, a lot of times it's not even technology, but just the fact that they know that you might be the person that can send them in the right direction. So whether or not I can answer the question, my goal is at least to help facilitate the conversation so that I can then hopefully you know, get that process or that change started. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Next question. How, uh, from your role, how important and how difficult is it to connect your technology initiatives to the enterprise business objectives as well as the community of patients? So that's one of the number one things we hear uh, from CIOs and other folks of that ilk that they have to be aligned with the business objectives of the organization, whatever they're doing. And then you get into the whole governance thing. So what are your thoughts there? Sure. So um, I think it's really important for the CMIOs to be aware of the organization's strategic plan as well as the vision. And with that comes what are the business initiatives um, in addition to other um, technology initiatives. And so, so part of this is just um, participating in uh, any planning meetings that you get invited to, um, you know, speaking up if you see something that you feel like would be a great um, a, a technology initiative or a business objective. Um, also, one thing that's really important is that we um, 
focus on kind of on the care of the consumer. So two things I really like to focus on, and you heard me earlier, is really care for the caregiver, but also care for the consumer. And so um, one thing I had even mentioned at SLT, I think everyone thought it was crazy, is let's stop, stop calling them patients. Let's start calling them customers. And so we're, I mean, we're a business. And so what can we do to really engage with our customers? Because it's not just the patient, it's their family members as well, and it's their extended family members. And so really trying to, to care for our consumer across a lifetime of health um, is one of the things that I think it's important that the CMIO is aware of. And so uh, honestly, participating in the strategic planning, um, we have a, a transition, um, a transformation council which takes new initiatives, new strategic ideas and vets them out. And so, you know, sending, um, Innovate, sending innovative ideas to your leadership um, is saying, hey, I've seen this. Um, is this something that we could possibly consider, maybe not even if this year, but for next year? Um, and so, you know, again, kind of start small, just making sure that before you present it to a large audience, making sure that, you know, the, the people who would potentially find benefit will truly find value um, in what you're proposing. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, next question. What's the biggest challenge you see on the horizon that has not yet been vetted in the general healthcare community? So anything Dr. Stacy Johnston sees that maybe not everybody else is seeing? So, you know, I, I think the, um, there are several things. Obviously, technology is going to continue to advance. Our, 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 uh, our clinical knowledge is doubling at a rate where people just can't keep up. Um, and so that is something that I think will be more difficult um, to manage. And right now, a lot of that clinical decision support is what's going to be necessary in order for us to be um, aware of um, new clinical knowledge. For instance, precision health. So precision health is that, you know, pharmacogenomics, um, a genomics based towards your um, tumor for your oncology patients. Um, but unless you have some clinical decision support to help guide your providers, they may not be aware of new genetic markers that are out there. Mm -hmm. Again, our, our medical knowledge is doubling at the speed that, that your average person just cannot keep up with. Um, so really embracing that clinical decision support, really embracing that, that the cognitive algorithms um, that can help facilitate the end user make decisions based on right. this particular patient at this particular time with this particular um, genomic marker on this particular medication and how do you process that you, you know your brain can't process that but then no. technology can and so utilizing the technology but then staying ahead of it. And so um, that's going to be the hardest part is, is staying ahead of your clinical decision support, staying ahead of AI. Um, and again, I, I don't want to scare everyone that, you know, if you're not already doing this, you're, you're behind the eight ball. Um, but we have, you know, we have a precision health, which is our pharmacogenomics um, uh, team. And so we are setting ourselves up to have that fully embedded clinical decision support uh, around we're going to start small, you know, start with two markers, start with five markers, whatever your organization can handle, but you should start to think about that pharmacogenomics and, and precision health and what it means to us moving forward. Well, that's excellent. I think, you know, your points there about clinical decision support are just right on and make so much sense. So I think that's great. I just want to uh, read a little bit of information from our sponsor, GE, just to slide, and then we will get back to our discussions. Um, so please join GE Healthcare at HIMSS in Orlando, which I'll be winging on down to, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call are going to be going down there, as they introduce Graffiti, the virtual collaborator. It's a clinical virtual assistant with AI-enabled skills. Good time to bring up this slide, right? We are just talking yeah. about it. Designed yeah. to help simplify access to patient data and inform critical thinking from a mobile device. We all love our mobile devices. Text graffiti at hymns. Oh, test graffiti at hymns and send your day time preference to graffiti at ge.com. Great collaborations are a key to the future of healthcare. Who could argue with that, right? All right, very good. So let's get back to 
our questions. I do have sort of a fun one for you. I want to run by you real okay. quick. Is you you ready for this? So you sure. had mentioned that you're a Star Wars fan. Yes. So what can you what can we take from science fiction? What what are some cool things you've seen in a sci-fi movie or anything that you go that maybe someday could happen? You know, we got the whole thing with with the tricorder, is that what they call it? When the star star that Star Trek, they run it up and down the person, it tells them everything that's wrong. So yeah. anything come to mind? I mean, we don't want the Borg, right? We don't want the Borg situation where right. and we have to assimilate. But go ahead. So um, uh, there's a couple things, and I think that's so funny because if you've ever seen Back to the Future 2, when they go um, to 2015, they're basically FaceTiming and um, the White Sox <laughs> win. And so, I mean, it's things that, like, really happened. And so um, so that's pretty funny. So everyone should check out Back to the Future 2. Um, from 1985, they were projecting 30 years in the future. Um, and, and the hoverboard was there. So I just think it's pretty funny. Um, uh -huh. But also – I, I think, you know, the we will see start seeing robots, um, you know, more. Here at Baptist, we're actually um, using robots for um, our medications and, and uh, IVs and creating IVs. Um, so that's um, one of the things that we have this one person that does it, and they are – they're killing it in the robotic mm -hmm. um, titration of IVs. Um, uh, so ro a lot of more like robotic process and uh, automation as well to um, I, I think I always joke that teleportation would be awesome because I do have to go to meetings and they're back to back and the, inevitably I never have any travel time. So I always joke that my teleportation module has been broken. Um, but um, I, I really think, you know, honestly, probably the one of the things um, we'll see the most is is robots i anticipate seeing them in the hallways kind of as greeters you know like welcome here and can i take you know can i guide you and so mm -hmm. um so that there are organizations that are currently doing that um baptists are not quite there yet with robots for greeters but um other organizations are using a lot of the um virtual assistant um having um you know basically an Alexa in the room, being able to call your nurse. Um, so, so using a lot of more voice recognition capability, I think will be um, really cool. I'm hoping, I'm super excited about a virtual assistant for physicians. You know, I'd like to see us become an early adopter of that. Um, and again, trying to target that physician burnout. Um, I, I think a lot of the, um, you know, just being able to, um, use more of the the robotics in terms of surgery um and um ai with surgery i mean that's coming too where you know the the robot actually does the surgery in itself and you're just kind of overseeing it um and, and i think that's probably where we're going to see a lot of actually improvements and probably not that far off right right and it's got to work, right? Because if we put in these assistants and bots and everything, and I mean, we know what we know what happened with phone trees. Am right. I crazy? Does everyone dislike phone trees? Because how many times you just want to speak to a person, oh, right? Yeah. And, exactly. and you just can't get where you want to be. So I, I'm guessing that's a that's a big overall lesson as we go down the AI road. Right. It's got to work because if right. it doesn't understand what you said more than once, you say it's more more harm than good. It is. I, I agree. I mean, it has to be really well vetted, really well tested. Right. Um, um, but I, I do think we're going to see more robotics um, and surgeries and um, AI in surgeries and robotics in, in phar um, pharmacy as well. All right. Let me just ask you one final question and we'll wrap up. Um, okay. I think that it's important that you give any other advice you have to CMIOs or those aspiring to the role. So you've been in it a long time in different, you know, you sort of evolved into it as the role evolves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you certainly have a lot of experience. So for those who are on the, the line today or who listen to this webinar who, again, have the role or aspire to it, um, what's your best advice to them on how to be successful? Um, so for, for me, uh, being enthusiastic, you know, keep – keep learning, keep challenging yourself. Um, there isn't a class I haven't met that I haven't 
signed up for and I've mm-hmm. enjoyed in one way or another. I just, in fact, I just went through ITIL training, which everyone laughed. Why are you going through ITIL training? I said, you know, if my project managers are expected to know this process, then I should probably right. know it as well too. Um, and so, you know, I, I went back and I got my master's in healthcare administration. Um, you know, I, I think just continuing to, to grow and challenge yourself and, and step out of your comfort zone. Um, it, it is hard to, to say, hey, you know, I, I think I'd be a, a great person for this, you know, consider me. And so, um, you know, it, it, the more you do that, the more opportunities mm-hmm. you're going to have that uh, that are, you know, get not necessarily given to you, but that you will have the option of being able to participate in. And so not necessarily letting those opportunities come to you, but actually going out and searching them. Um, you know, if there's something that's really neat that you'd like to participate in, say, hey, you know, I, I'm willing to do that. You know, I don't mind coming in early. I don't mind staying late, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so that's kind of the more you can do that, the more you can put yourself out there. And, and again, it might be, um, you know, it might be hard for some people, um, actually, then the more you do it, the more comfortable you are mm-hmm. with it, with actually saying, hey, I think I'd be the perfect person to do this. Choose me, you know. So yeah. um, anyway, that's the biggest thing I'd, I'd say for, for anyone that's looking to um, do this or, or to even, you know, go expand their horizon or go to a, a bigger organization. Excellent. All right. Well, that's about all we had time for today. What a fun, wonderful chat. I uh, really enjoyed that. Regarding continuing education, uh, if you need uh, a, a sort of proof uh, that you were here for a CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. You, uh, you'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready. We'll get that on our YouTube channel and make sure everyone gets a link to that. If you want to sponsor uh, one of our upcoming events or book a custom event, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our website to register for our upcoming webinars. I want to thank very much uh, my good friend, my new friend, Dr. Stacy Johnston, who I'm having a feeling will be on a future event with us. She is wonderful. I want to thank, thank uh, GE. I want to thank GE Healthcare and Roche for sponsoring today's event and making this wonderful education possible. And I want to thank you, our end- attendees, for continuing to come to our events. So, with that, Dr. Johnston, everyone else, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Where do you want to